Yesterday, I tried to do two things. First, lay out the claim about the economic uh, determinants of the relatively larger role of social cooperation in the information economy. And then to extract from that an approach toward cooperative human systems design applied offline as well as online as a general approach to designing systems of interaction among people based on assumptions of a more diverse motivational profile than the rational actor uh, model that has dominated much of, of systems design in the last 40, 50 years. What I'll try to do today uh, is two things. Uh, the first is to make more explicit than I did in, in the 2006 book uh, the role of power and to begin to offer a way of describing power and social relations in the same mode that I did in trying to explain it in liberal theory, in liberal political theory, in terms that can be converted to um, uh, uh, liberal and standard behavioral uh, um, 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 sciences language so as to create a transition between critical work that focuses on power in society um, um, and, and human behavior studies and, and economics uh, and mo modes of analysis that are easily translatable uh, to a wide range of discourses in contemporary American um, uh, and European discourse. Uh, and this I do, as, as we had a conversation a little bit yesterday in the seminar, uh, as a matter of, of um, an effort to create a, 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 an analytic framework that is uh, very broadly accessible to a wide range of methodological and um, um, uh, political viewpoints, as opposed to something that's discreetly left and critical. Um, the second thing that I'll do in the second half of today's talk is begin to raise the questions about how utopian this utopianism is, and what are the limits, and to what extent we need to be worried. And I already started to raise the flags yesterday when I talked about Amazon Mechanical Turk, and thread lesson about the possibility of capture and, and undermining uh, of this path. Because at no point, uh, have I made a deterministic claim about the benevolent future, but rather that there's a conflict between different ways of organizing uh, wor the world and life uh, and possibilities, but also uh, risks. So let me start with power, and let me start by telling a story that I already told in Chapter 7 of the 2006 book. Uh, much of the rest won't be repetition of what I said, but this is a particularly useful example. So if you look today at uh, Diebold, uh, uh, um, at the company Diebold, you won't find this, which is what you found in 2002 on their site. A major part of their business was uh, selling election systems. If you look today, you'll find all sorts of different things about ATMs, but nothing about, uh, uh, about uh, voting uh, systems. It's all been outsourced to a subsidiary called Premier, where you'll find nowhere a relationship to Debo. What's the story behind this? As some of you may remember, in 2000, we had a bit of an issue with presidential election tallying. Um, and so by 2002, there was an effort to introduce uh, electronic voting as a way to solve the hanging chads problem. Um, and there were some concerns that were raised. And when you look at report, the first state that did this was Georgia. When you look at reports in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, as well as the New York Times and other places, the structure of the conversation was always the same. Some people raised concerns about electronic voting, but person A, whom we spoke to, said that these systems were well tested um, uh, and worked well. And person B said that the company was always ready to support if there would be any problems. And person A was uh, the company uh, vendor. And person B was the state official who bought the machine from the company. And all was well. There was, however, one activist, Ben Harris, who was uh, less than completely uh, pleased with this and, and got uh, a source code. How it was leaked is not entirely clear. Uh, but what she did was she put it on blackboxvoting.org, uh, 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 a site, uh, and then it was also picked up in Scoop in New Zealand, uh, that placed a different model of analysis. If you imagine that the traditional model of watchdog 
in the mainstream, in, 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 the, in the mass media environment, the ideal case was Pentagon Papers, right? So you've got inter insider knowledge gets transmitted from Ellsberg to the New York Times that uses its money to put two reporters reading the materials, analyzing them, and then publishing. And when the government tries to shut them down, they hand it over to the Washington Post, and when the government tries to shut them down, they use all of the money that they have from being such a powerful company to hire a top First Amendment lawyer to run all the way to the Supreme Court. The First Amendment steps in, forces the revelation of the Pentagon Papers, and changes the result. The system is a system that relies on the relative concentrated power of the New York Times on one hand. Its dependence on market as opposed to state as its source of funding on the other to provide it the means by which it goes to law as the source and an independent judiciary that forces through the First Amendment revelation and the watchdog function. That's the model that we see of the 20th century First Amendment model based on major powerful market-based media as the watchdog over a government. This model is very different. This model, this is from Scoop at the time. First of all, it's not trust us, we have two reporters in an office looking at it. Um, uh, we now have the physical information, uh, make them available on websites and file sharing networks uh, in case they get shut down. Now some of these may be uh, password protected, but here are these nice people from lostpasswords.com, uh, they can help you with that. Some of these may be corrupted, but here are these nice people from Zip Repair, uh, uh, why don't you use their utility? And we can't pay anyone to analyze this, but it's really important, it's the new Watergate. If you find anything, let us know here in this forum. See for yourself, collaborate on trying to analyze, communicate to each other, and we'll move this forward. Um, <clears throat> indeed, this is what happens to a great extent. Some of the people who review is, who reviews include a group led by Abby Rubin and Johns Hopkins um, uh, through, because it's a university center that focuses on security and shows holes, there's media exposure, Diebold has to respond, Maryland requires uh, 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 a review and studies and then modification in the system. Ben Harris then becomes another set, uh, uh, source so that when you have an anonymous whistleblower who finds a cache of internal company emails, that whistleblower essentially sends to one, to Wired, which is the closest thing uh, uh, in this case to a, to a mass media outlet. And Wired writes a story and says, can you believe these guys lost their stuff again? First they use their source code, now they lose their emails, and that's it. Harris puts it on black box voting, same story, except for one thing. At this point, Diebold sends a Digital Millennium Copyright Act notice, a DMCA notice, to uh, Harris's ISP, Internet Service Provider, and says the ISP will be liable for copyright infringement of the emails, of the content of the emails, unless they shut down Harris. So they shut her down. But we've already seen the technique uh, introduced, which was go cache it, right? So what's the statement here? If you look at the technique, as we anticipate attempts to prevent the distribution of this information, we encourage supporters of democracy to make copies of these files and to make them available on websites and file sharing networks. This is in 2002. And indeed, this is what a few students at Swarthmore do. But Diebold already knows how to deal with this, so they sent Swarthmore the, uh, a copyright violation. So now what's interesting here is that you take a system originally designed, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, to control <coughs> distribution, to, to solve problems of Hollywood and the recording industry and their model. Transposed into a system that's in, in an effort to shut down whistleblowing. And then metastasizing to control the relationship between a university and its students completely in a different context to shut down. So an effort to leverage one system designed for one purpose to control and change the relationship of an educational system in the other direction. That should end everything, except, of course, it doesn't. Um, instead, what you get is that the students replicate the materials by other users on other campuses, but also introduce them into Freenet, which is itself a pre-Napster, peer-to-peer network optimized for censorship resistance, primarily originally used uh, 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 for China, uh, but also Overnet, that is to say a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing network, um, um, which has both proprietary uh, 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 um, 
proprietary clients and free software clients, and FreeNet itself is free software. So what we see is an ecosystem that combines commercial and non-commercial, open source and proprietary, legal and illegal activities, all combining to create a resistant ecology that prevents censorship of the materials. Now, law is not entirely irrelevant. Um, the students did, in fact, bring a declaratory judgment against, uh, 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 against uh, Diebold to say, this is illegal for you, it's an illegal use under the First Amendment for you to shut us up using copyright. And they win, but they win one year later. Too late to have had an effect on the uh, election. Instead, what we actually saw was that while the emails were still being supposedly illegally circulating, the California State Election Commission suddenly comes across uh, uh, evidence in the emails that suggests that the Diebold actually was deploying uh, uh, software that was not certified by the state, decertified a huge portion of, of the um, um, machines, and had them um, 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 changed and, and, and adapted all in time to the election, which would not have been had they relied on the, on the uh, alternative model. So if you compare this to the story I told you about the Pentagon Papers, you see two very different systems of watchdog in terms of who performs the watchdog, how independence from a uh, 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 potential shutdown by the state or by private parties occurs. And it happens through re redundant capabilities, decentralized in a way that is practically impossible uh, to control through a combination of both legal and illegal, commercial and non-commercial, proprietary and non-proprietary uh, techniques. In this context, to a great extent, what we see is freedom as bobbing and weaving between systems of constraint and affordance that allow individuals or groups to dodge the power plays of some and exert their own power in pursuit of their own goals. And we'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by loose coupling. But essentially, loose coupling is uh, the extent to which being inside a system determines the outcome of the interaction through that system, or the extent to which a system has enough uh, freedom of action within the system so that even though you can use its affordances, it doesn't necessarily determine uh, the outcome. And in this regard, the net was the more loosely coupled system than the mass media the system that depended on the Supreme Court to come in and, and, and right into the rescue. Without that, you could shut down the system. And whether or not you have an open system, that is to say a system where there are symmetric constraints between different uh, players and you can shift from one system to another so that when you move from the commercial ISP <coughs> that supported Ben Harris to the university, out to the other systems as well as the P2P network, all of these were available for these data to uh, replicate themselves across uh, uh, other places. So what do I mean by power and what's the definition that I'll be using? I'm talking about the capacity of one entity to alter the behaviors, configurations, or outcomes of others, measured in terms of probabilities of deviation from a baseline preferred behavior, configuration, or outcome. So an agent, A1, can be said to have power over A2 or the other agent to the extent that A1 can act in a way that increases the probability that A1, A2 will behave B1, that is to say the way A1 prefers C1 or O1, obviously, rather than B2, that is to say behave as A2 would have preferred before the interaction um, uh, or, or had the, the uh, configuration to or outcome to. Um, I'm using this and I'm backing it out of the way in which economists uh, uh, define market power, again, as a translation mechanism between what would be recognizable to a critical analysis of power that is about one party being able to control others systematically and a framework that still recognizes the idea of preferences, principles, and policies that are self-driven, whether it's preferences in economics, principles, or policies in terms of liberal theory more generally of choice, um, uh, as, and provides a framework in which to begin to also explain once we talk about not only behaviors, but also uh, uh, preferences uh, uh, to, to bring in the question of, of, of uh, cultural power and the ability to shape preferences. And I'll, I'll uh, um, uh, 
dig a little deeper into that in a couple of minutes. Um, let me just evoke again from what I talked about yesterday with regard to integrated system, talking about human actions and conditions played out within the affordances and constraints of multiple subsystems that intersect as dimensions of force acting on a set of behaviors and outcomes in context. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about a political system that moves the forces of the state and the question of the extent to which we have new ways of moving the political system and exerting power over uh, the network public sphere, over uh, the ability to communicate against and argue against um, uh, someone. And so, so Castell uh, is now calling it mass self-communication. Uh, industrial organization, modalities of production, daily life and fabrication of context. This is all of what I was talking about yesterday in the second half. Um, uh, culture and meaning making, I talked about it some yesterday, I'll talk about it a lot more today in a couple of minutes. Uh, institutional, the degree to which we actually have more commons or more property and how that works. And the technical platforms of design, again, we talked about that more yesterday. So the idea is to imagine individuals operating at, at an intersection of these integrated systems and having ability to do things and not to do things, affordances and constraints that are determined by the sum total of forces operating within each of these systems. And in trying to analyze the degree to which a particular person or group of people are more or less free or more or less susceptible to the power of others, we need to look at the intersection of all of these forces. So in the Diebold story, we had a legal force for a certain period constraining behavior by attacking particular strategic places that were previously used by the B, by, by, by the A2s, in that case, the students or Bev Harris, and trying to shut those down using law to shut down the technical system and make it more constrained. However, the design of the technical system was such that the users were able to shift to a different system that was less susceptible to control and therefore the technical system allowed them a certain freedom until the legal system switched uh, in the other direction. And so essentially being able to shift between systems and use the affordances of one system, in that case the P2P uh, network, a particular implementation of the technical system, is what permitted the freedom rather than the internal constraints within the system of law of First Amendment versus copyright, uh, uh, etc. So it was actually the freedom to shift between systems, and that's what's critical for me to get, a, to get around. The relative openness between systems and the ability to shift within a system from a technical system that assumes an ISP to a technical system that has a P2P framework that allowed for that particular freedom of behavior. And I'll do more of this, and, and I'll repeat this when we come back to, to, to culture in a minute or two. Um, for some reason, this is projecting poorly, but um, I'll go through. <coughs> Part of what I'm trying to do is uh, translate work done by a legal scholar named Wesley Hofeld about 100 years ago. And Hofeld was trying to be very crisp about what it means to have a right, and what it means to be bound by a duty, and what it means to have a privilege, and what it means to have somebody else not have a duty. And I'm generalizing from here, from him, if we had imagined power as power is always relational, someone has power, the other person has susceptibility. To say that someone has freedom is essentially to say that someone else has no power. What that means is that we can't define power and susceptibility or freedom except in relation between potential agent or actants trying to control the other. Um, and this is along multiple uh, uh, dimensions of both behavior, both in terms of preferences, principles, policies, and actions, as well as outcomes and configuration. And by configuration, I essentially mean power or freedom regarding who has power over whom, through what mechanisms and pathways in a given system. Both power within the system, and this goes to the question of the loose coupling, and, co and power between systems, or the extent to which you can move in and out of the system uh, uh, for the particular interaction. <coughs> the extent to which once an interaction is controlled by a system, it's completely controlled by that system. So what's, a, what, what's an example uh, uh, of this? Um, actually, I'll, I'll give some more examples and that I hope will make things uh, clear. So here's an example. Um, 
Prince moves to sue websites. Uh, fan sites dedicated to Prince say they've been served legal notice to remove all images of the singer, his lyrics, and anything linked to Prince's likeness. Okay, so that's a move that's typical of the technique of the recording industry in the last 15 years or so, which is essentially to look at the potentials of digital distribution of music and to try to use the legal system to control the ways in which the technological system structures the way in which fans interact with music. So again, in the context of dimensions of power, what we have is in the early 1990s, mobilization of political power over, um, uh, over uh, uh, through lobbying to pass laws like the No Electronic Theft Act, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, in particular those two, um, which in turn strengthened institutional power through ratcheting up the extent of property rights, criminalizing the uh, sharing of files well beyond what was true before 1998. So before 1998, you had to essentially be a commercial producer of exact copies in order to violate copyright criminally. After 1998, it was enough that you shared a lot of uh, files, even if all you did was you shared files and others shared them back with you to be criminal. So a strong emphasis on criminal enforcement, a um, uh, strong technological constraint through digital rights management and digital locks and encryption, industrial organization with the structure of the recording industry around highly capitalized record labels, production and marketing and the fan system, and an effort here, and you see in Prince's saying, you can't use my likeness in any way, to maintain cultural meaning making of the particular artist as a one-way control system. You have to see me the way I project myself uh, to you. An effort to have a, a, across multiple systems the ability to control what it means to uh, be a fan of uh, Prince. Now, it's important to remember that property as an institution depends on asymmetric power. The reason that it depends on asymmetric power is that markets are mechanisms by which you, co you come to the person who has that asymmetric power and buy them off in terms of the ability to act. If there weren't asymmetric power with one person having the power to say yes and another no, uh, you wouldn't know whom to pay. You wouldn't be able to function in the market. Asymmet asymmetric power is central to how property functions. And it's important to recognize that property is a mechanism for devolving the power of the state to non-state actors so they can deploy it over resources. That is to say, what makes property property is the threat the sheriff will come after you if you take it from me. It doesn't exist without the state. And what it does, though, is it distributes, distributes the power to call on the state uh, 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 throughout the population so that you can have a market function around permissions to act without me calling uh, the sheriff. But power turns out to be not one-dimensional in this system. Turns out that fans can push back. And so we see fans pushing on institutional power through, policy, through property by actually ignoring it, um, um, or pushing back on technology uh, by idealizing hackers who help break the technology, and pushing back on cultural meaning making and the social practices uh, uh, and norms of fan culture. So for example, just even in the same story, we see that fans have vowed to fight what they say was censorship. The move was a shock to many of his followers, etc. So already you see a cultural argument over the degree of legitimacy and stability of the claim that I can control <coughs> by invoking, calling the supposed <coughs> private power by its name that we call it for public power, which is censorship. Um, um, and trying to destabilize that distinction between property and state power. So again, we see the state putting these federal, the, these anti-piracy warnings and trying to say, I will criminalize this. But we see cultural adoption of the term pirate as cool. And the, and the resistance of the idea that piracy is in fact uh, illegitimate. And we see the industry itself not being particularly good at staying on message when it tells us that piracy is really cool and sexy. Um, 
in any of it. There has to be a better way uh, than this particular model of trying to control. And what I want to do now is spend a few minutes describing to you uh, uh, a study that uh, a few students of mine and I have just finished, uh, looking at how some artists now are actually using very different dimensions of power to create an alternative sustainable model of music production that doesn't depend on the legal and technical forcing constraints, but rather shifts to um, uh, a social system of cooperation. So the best known example of this is not something we actually studied because it's too, it's too well known, essentially. Uh, this is, uh, um, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, Trent Reznor trying. So you had the, the in 2007, uh, the inevitable rise and liberation of Nicky Tarda's failure at 18%, right? Only 18% actually paid for the album that was otherwise released uh, freely. But still, 140,000 direct artist revenue, more than uh, 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 the artists had made in prior normal channels, uh, something that would have required a million dollars worth of sale to recover that much for the artist, because we're in a context in which the artist receives all of the revenues directly online, instead of through the traditional organizational model. Uh, Reznor learns the lesson uh, and now ends up the uh, Nine, Inch Ails, Nine Inch Nails later released Ghosts 1 to 4 for a variety of a free download, $5 download. The free download is, is only nine tracks. This is in higher quality and more. Various kinds of CD sets, a $75 deluxe set, a $300 ultra deluxe set, a variety of different affordances that include Free and what you get in the first year, the first week, is 1.6 million dollars uh, from 781 transactions in the first week uh, after release. And today you're seeing Reznor uh, expanding to uh, various downloads uh, for iPhone and iPod, etc. Uh, most importantly, an introduction to Remix.nin.com uh, and an introduction to basically say, let's make meaning together culturally, not just I'm telling you, but we're making together. What Lea Belsky, Byron Carr, Max Berkelhammer, and I did was look at a few uh, sort of mid-level and unknown artists um, uh, and look at data over time that have been for several years trying these kinds of uh, uh, approaches. Um, and so this is uh, data on single uh, MP3 uh, downloads in terms of what people were paying. Uh, this describes the 25th to 75th percentile of contributions. This is a context that, and I'll explain in a minute, that doesn't have a required payment at all, a required transaction at all. So in some sense, it's the lowest load. What we see from three and a half years is that you see a relatively similar pattern to what you see in the industry. <coughs> right off the release of an album, a lot of payment goes down. This is a context in which uh, just after Radiohead released their album for free, there was a lot of media and attention to her, uh, which was why there was a new interest. And here, there's another release uh, uh, of another album. Now, hers was the system that was least well uh, designed from the cooperative human systems design that I talked about yesterday for a variety of reasons that I'll, uh, that I'll talk about for about a minute, in a minute. Uh, but first of all, let's see how uh, poorly this did. The first thing is, even though it was a purely voluntary donation model with all sorts of ambiguous messages, 22% of people who downloaded the music actually paid. When they paid, they paid an average of $1.25 per track. As opposed and nine dollars per album, as opposed to a point ninety nine a ninety nine cent industry practice in the in the uh, um, in the forced payment model. Um, so you're looking again, just as you saw with even the failed supposed experiment of Nikki Tardas, um, uh, the artists coming home with more than they do in the traditional uh, 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 industrial model. Uh, what are the complications? So some things clearly fit the model of, of um, um, so it clearly fit the model of cooperative human systems design, an explicit statement of morality. This store model is based on the belief that people are good, in trust our best outcomes, uh, our best comes forward, full forth, etc. But there are also mixed messages. So she uses, she calls it a store. She anchors it in a market price. She calls it a market price instead of calling it, uh, 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 as we'll see in, in magnitude. Um, uh, normal, she talks about average donation, 
Um, uh, she gives a pay later option that essentially gets used by a lot of people who feel like they don't want to explicitly not pay, but then they don't pay, they say pay later and they forget. So there's a whole lot of ways in which she's lowering the emotional load on people to actually contribute, and nonetheless you get 22% um, uh, payment. Um, a little bit on the industrial uh, model. Um, the industry model of forced payment, the industry claims, as of 2009, something like 95% of songs are still, 95% of, do of downloads are still illegal, and only 5% are paid. So if you take the industry's claims at its, at its, uh, um, uh, at its uh, uh, um, face value, then of 100 songs downloaded, about five songs are paid for at the industry standard of, of, of 99 cents. Total revenue is five dollars. The industry takes about four. Uh, the, the artist takes about one. Now, if you take voluntary payment, even in this least well-designed of the three that we'll look at, of 100 songs downloaded, you're looking at an average uh, 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 at an average price that would get you 25 bucks, of which the artist will take 20 and pay five for overhead. So you're looking at a model at which, um, uh, even though it doesn't force payment, the artist goes home with uh, a, a higher return and able to uh, make a better living. This is a different site called Magnitude, and they've now shifted completely to uh, subscription. So this is um, 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 no longer their model. But nonetheless, we have five and a half years of data uh, and again, what you get is a fairly stable contribution over years uh, of $8 per album uh, payments. Again, what's critical here is the albums are released under Creative Commons license, so it is legal to copy and give to your uh, 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 friends. The albums are released in a non-DRM format, so it is technically feasible, and yet you get payment. And in fact, what you see here that's very crisp is that in the design there's a pull-down menu that tell you, tells you what the minimum payment, the typical, the better than average, generous, very, very generous, and uh, we love you. 48% of people over five years gave what was noted as typical, $8 per album. Now just in case you think there's a smooth distribution, only 0.34% gave 8.5. Only 16% gave the minimum, which is roughly the same as those who gave better than average and generous. Again, very strong response to normative claims. All of this is essentially voluntary payment because it is legal and technically feasible to share. Um, uh, so that essentially what these, uh, 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 um, uh, what these sites are doing is um, uh, moving from a system that combines law and technology to try to exercise unilateral power and control the payment, they're self-consciously abjuring those powers and saying, I'm not taking this power. It's not that it's not copyrighted, but I'm licensing it to you freely. It's not that I can't encrypt it, but I'm handing it over in the high format without encryption, but in exchange, I expect for you to reciprocate in a cooperative system and pay so that I can make a living as an artist and you can enjoy uh, uh, my music. Um, the last one we'll talk about is Jonathan Colton, uh, who is a, uh, a computer programmer turned uh, musician um, and who really combines all of these things uh, together. Um, partly it certainly, uh, uh, certainly includes a store. Yes, you should buy things. Great idea. You can download it here and here and here. You're, I'm best off if you download it here. Here are karaoke versions. Here are ringtones. Uh, there's merchandise. But this is embedded in, as I said, licensing of Creative Commons, uh, uh, licensing, triggering reciprocity, and specific things that you're saying um, uh, you should buy this, lowering the emotional load on, uh, on, on the supposed piracy and stealing by specifically saying already stole it, putting it into a somewhat jocular relationship with, uh, with buy a monkey or a banana uh, 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 to pay for it. So essentially what you're doing is unilateral disarmament from the hard power and invocation of soft power and a, and a dynamic of uh, reciprocity. No less important, uh, in terms of the industrial organization, what he does is demand me in your town. That is to say, you 
fans decide where you want me to perform, set up enough people to come, and I will come where you uh, perform. So you're essentially part of the construction of the performance. And you're part of the construction of the performance also in the sense of here's the stuff you've created, here are the mashups that you've done to my music, here are the things you've done, and you get a community of people communicating around their own creations with the artist's music to become part of, of a single interaction, which then obviously uh, uh, they uh, look to fund. Now, as a matter of um, um, as a matter of economic uh, sustainability, uh, Colton in the last uh, uh, few years has been making enough just from the downloads, not from the performances, that he would have had to get something on the order of 600 to 700,000 iTunes downloads per year uh, uh, on the traditional model to replicate uh, those revenues. That is to say, it would have to be remarkably successful, uh, even though he's a relatively small scale artist. So how does this look in uh, practice? <laughs> I quit, I quit my day job a little over a year ago writing okay. software, and uh, and uh, it was a terrible mistake. Does anybody need somebody who knows how to write in VB? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm joking. You should all quit your jobs tomorrow. It's fantastic. <laughs> it works out really well, you know. Uh, anyway, so I wrote this song about my experiences uh, as a software designer, and this is called Code <laughs> So what comes down is a mashup of several different uh, uh, user videos. Code monkey, get up, get coffee. Code monkey, go to job. Code monkey, have boring meeting. Boring manager, Rob. Rob say, code monkey, very diligent, but his output stinks. His code not functional or elegant. What do code monkey think? Code monkey think, baby. This is, uh, so this is a, a mashup of mashups that, that, that Anderson and Ito did. Um, but the point that I'm trying to get across with this is a very different dynamic in which you have self-conscious abjuring of the forcing vectors of the institutional and technological, while at the same time a reorganization of the industrial organization towards something in which fans and artists build together both the construction of meaning and the construction of the actual performance cycle under a, a, in a context in which the meaning of what happens is produced together and through social practices and norms of trust, of fairness, of moral ethical engagement with each other instead of through unilateral control through systems based on technological control and, and, and state power uh, uh, assigned to uh, an industrial uh, model. Essentially, you see a shift from institutional and technical unilateral hard power uh, to social soft power uh, with artists and fans trying to move together from a system in which the organizational infrastructure takes advantage of the artists and of the fans and has enormous extractive capacity. So the, the, the per employee 
revenue in 2002 of the recording industry was about half a million per employee, which was about double the per employee revenue of Hollywood or the software industry or the hardware, computer hardware industry. So enormously well designed to extract value from both the artists and the fans. And essentially, these are systems in which the fans and the artists together are shifting away from systems of control to systems of essentially soft power and persuasion uh, to build their alternative uh, model. Um, So part of the question is what makes cooperation in sociality center, ethical engagement, soft power based system more attractive than property uh, normatively? <laughs> Let's not forget that, soft, that, that these kinds of social demands can be enormously uh, uh, um, 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 controlling. You can imagine a situation if you just look at, at Marx on the Jewish question, basically the role of property and contract in liberating from heavily socially controlled uh, feudal relations, right? In context, a certain formality and break of social obligations that are obligations of, of, of subservience uh, can be enormously liberating. What we have to say is that in the particular historical context of the 21st century, after a way in which property and contract and, and, and technical system control allowed for a certain uh, uh, application of power, away from many people towards a relatively small number of capital intensive uh, enterprises, we can talk about these systems that are decentralized and base, based on social uh, 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 engagement and social norms as liberating relative to that baseline. Not forgetting that they too are a form of power that people apply to each other and they too in different contexts can end up ossifying into relations of power that are unattractive, we're breaking them up into relations that are more atomized, more treating each other as, as just uh, uh, through property and contract can end up being uh, liberating. But in the context in which we exist, um, commons and network information envir environment uh, offer pathways to route around late 20th century inequalities and modalities of domination. Um, they provide an institutional, technical, organizational space in which to recognize each other's shared humanity, um, uh, and essentially the absence, the absence of formal structures of control demands a space for mutual recognition that changes uh, uh, the dynamics of, of, of control uh, to dynamics of, of, of mutual recognition. Um, let me try to map this. Um, Let me try to map this uh, going relatively quickly through something that could easily spend an hour on by itself, but I won't. Uh, um, I'm repeating what I did yesterday, it would seem. Uh, but then it's not surprising, I always do this. Um, if we look at different sources, different dimensions of power, technology, law, communications of cultural expression, expression of recognition and validation, expression of moral condemnation, um, uh, marketing, competition dynamics, political lobbying, corporate acquisition, and standard setting processes. What I'll try to do to you now is give you very minimal description of what systems went into controlling fan video of the kind that we saw um, using existing uh, uh, video from the 70s all the way to today. So essentially, if you're looking at uh, uh, fan video circa 1970, the technical affordances are all largely one way, except for a little bit of maybe what could be done with 8 millimeter. Uh, largely, you're talking about a one-way system with relatively few uh, affordances, largely controlled through law, FCC law, and copyright law with regard to theaters and broadcasters, controlling uh, who the movies can or can't do. And essentially, you get these three platforms both technical and, and, and um, 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 contractual, controlling to a great extent with a very minimal room for fan uh, uh, production. With the introduction of the uh, VCR, we see a little more, we see the development of essentially a new platform that's closer to the home. We see a shift toward broadcasters and away from theaters to some extent as the core, uh, as the core platforms. 
we see efforts in law to constrain this, but then the Supreme Court essentially uh, uh, creates a fair <coughs> use exception for VCR developers that are then allowed uh, to market them. We see major battles between movie studios and broadcasters through financial interest and syndication uh, roles that end up placing more uh, power uh, in the broadcasters, um, and then ultimate, and, and then result in in uh, the movie studios buying some of the uh, uh, stations to create their own WB and UPN uh, uh, channels and Fox, obviously uh, first. Um, and we see a little bit more, but not hugely more, development of fan. Uh, culture around the fact that it's easier to send around uh, videotapes than it was to send around eight millimeters. It's easier for people to actually produce things um, uh, and, and uh, cut and create their own. We see a big change and a big jump um, uh, by the mid 90s once you have digital uh, uh, copying feasible. The, the debates now shift towards standard setting, in particular DVD standard setting, um, where, uh, 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 where Congress, the movie studios leans on Congress and the White House. In the early 90s, we have enormous pressure on the then White House to develop a very strong digital protection uh, 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 regime that ends up in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, uh, 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 heavily sponsored by the Clinton administration and passed by the uh, Gingrich Congress, uh, an interesting alliance in, in that context. Um, we see major debates over developing encryption. We see the emergence of new electronic freedom foundation type organizations that are pushing back. We begin to see hacker culture pushing back and finding decryptions for the DVD encryption, mm. which are sued by law, in this case, the US getting the Norwegian authorities to clamp down on a Norwegian teenager that allows for decryption of DVDs. We see an American nonprofit organization trying to fight that fight and losing it, but we see an enormous increase in the glorification of hackers as the preservers of freedom in the digital environment that feeds into a continuation <clears throat> of hacking of control, so as to make technical protection relatively weaker and begin, we're beginning to see a new set of platforms that enable fans to have much richer interactions with each other and that are centered around the open uh, 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 platform uh, of uh, the net. As we move to the last six years with the introduction of YouTube, of social networks, but also the move to uh, the iPhone and its particular uh, uh, role, what we see is a battle between different kinds of platforms. At one level, the cable companies and the telcos, particularly the cable companies, continue to be regular video distribution channels but they also become the broadband providers uh, to the home. And their platform now traverses both the internet-like platform that's controlled and all of the debates over net neutrality end up being about the degree to which this platform can control effectively the flow of voice, video, particularly for the cable companies, video uh, over the net. Um, uh, we, see the, uh, uh, we see the cable companies uh, um, uh, now moving to uh, see how they manage between these videos. Just now we're in the middle of the question of, of, of the NBC Comcast uh, takeover that's an effort to extend the power of cable over uh, video. But at the same time we see increased effectiveness of the open network with IBM during this period, what we talked about yesterday, providing enormous <coughs> legitimacy to free and open source software development that provides its own platform separately, and fan, and fan culture becomes celebrated even more, and in fact gets integrated into the production activities of some of the mainstream uh, traditional producers who now see this as a way of keeping fans. So you have an incredibly uh, unstable uh, state in which you have a very rich fan culture that depends on a very open framework, nonetheless under attack from two primary sources. One the debate over net neutrality and the ability of the cable industry to control the technical architecture, and two, the development of iPhone and, 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 and uh, the iPod and the iPhone as technical platforms that are adopted through the market, but nonetheless are highly controlled and proprietary in terms of their platform, and very different in the characteristics of control uh, from what we saw in the net. So essentially we have a, a potential of a universe 
in which we have <coughs> integrated proprietary controlled professional and beautiful <coughs> systems based on contracts of, so for example, the Bundesliga uh, uh, that, has, that gives uh, um, 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 exclusive to Deutsche Telekom and T-Mobile for their uh, uh, delivery of their uh, football games. That ends that particular path. Uh, in the US, we saw a period during which uh, Apple would not let uh, uh, Mark Fury have an app with his uh, tunes run on Apple uh, iStore because they were worried that his uh, 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 that his cartoons were too offensive. Um, uh, but again, the point is not whether that's right or wrong. The point is that this is an architecture that to the extent that it becomes the standard in which most internet access occurs, and that's an entirely plausible pathway, not through law, not through forcing, but through consumer adoption, it's a system that allows the firm in control to capture. Um, or what, whether what we'll have is some continued replication of what we already know, a commons based from the physical transport in Wi-Fi networks through the device, the logical layer, uh, and up through the content. Uh, and these are really the two potential ends of the spectrum with uh, a, a wide range uh, of possibilities in between. Um, what I'm going to do now is shift to talk some more about the potential threats and limitations and possibilities on the political side. Um, so those of you who, uh, 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 when I talked about um, uh, uh, the Diebold case, uh, we're in the middle of, of one of our own right now, right? It's WikiLeaks. Um, what's interesting about WikiLeaks is that it has the same characteristic as the Diebold case, except now it's more in sophisticatedly integrated into the traditional ma ma mass media. So the first instance of the si series of three major attacks of WikiLeaks on the US government was this relatively narrow one. We had the site collateral, uh, uh, raise this video collateral murder, which ended up being edited uh, to put the US in a particularly bad uh, um, um, light, uh, put on by WikiLeaks.org, in, uh, 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 in which a Reuters reporter among others, is, is seen as, as being uh, attacked by a US uh, helicopter. Now, Reuters tried to get this under freedom of information, tried to go through the traditional media of an established organization through established law, getting the material, so the Pentagon Papers model, and failed. WikiLeaks was able to obtain these materials, put them up, but then, in a sophisticated way, used all of the traditional trappings of meeting at the National Press Club, releasing it to the New York Times, etc. to get a lot of, of traction. Then we saw uh, the, Afga the Afghan documents and most recently the Iraq war documents where WikiLeaks plays an even more sophistic sophisticated game of giving it to the New York Times, the Guardian and the Spiegel so that there's enough exclusivity to create economic uh, incentive to really bump it up, enough diversity so that no single point of failure can be shut down by its government and, and a very sophisticated game but, and this is the but, and my set of questions begins about how robust the, 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 the democracy and democratizing effects are. A month later, the leaker was jailed. Uh, after the Afghan war documents and the Iraq war documents, uh, Assange becomes under public investigation for rape uh, in Sweden. Uh, the, it is the, the, the founder uh, and leader. Just at the same day that the Iraq documents uh, were published, New York Times front, front page, uh, has uh, uh, a piece that's very much um, um, one that tries to describe Assange as um, power grabbing, being left by his lieutenants, someone who is too much, too full of himself, right mm -hmm. alongside this story. So the question then that we remain with on the table is to what extent this ends up being a robust model and to what extent we see different systems that, might, uh, that states might bring to bear on distributed individuals who use the fact that they can move from one jurisdiction to another, that they can place their servers in different kinds of jurisdictions to resist censorship on the Diebold model that we saw and now on WikiLeaks, to what extent they're nonetheless susceptible to attack. We don't know yet. Uh, we'll see. Uh, and we can talk about that later uh, if we want. Essentially, the claim is that if the mass media and the public sphere required very large capital investment in order to speak, 
essentially either commercial funding or government funding was necessary in order to reach the audience, which also pulled public parties in the direction of uh, uh, money. A lot of uh, media criticism focused on the tension between professional values and uh, corporate uh, values, and citizens were largely passive. And the hope is that what we're seeing is a bit of a pull away from purely uh, monetary uh, uh, and capital controls towards somewhere between more citizens and more room for professional values. So in addition to the New York Times, we now have, uh, just in the last year in terms of Pulitzers, we have ProPublica, um, a, a non-profit, highly professional newsroom that whose costs are sufficiently lower than those of a traditional newsroom that it can be sustained on a non-profit model. Similarly, American Independent Media now has efforts to fund local equivalent uh, newsrooms uh, uh, in local areas. We see foundations. We talked yesterday about the Sunlight Foundation. We talked today about WikiLeaks. The idea is, again, that by leveraging social production, nonprofits can become more effective and more sustainable uh, to a larger extent. We see new high visibility commercial blogs like Token Points Memo. We see a new party press like Daily Costs. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we'll talk about that in one minute. Uh, so we, and we see citizen journalism, the camera phone footage, what I talked about yesterday with regard to uh, Iran and, and the BBC uh, uh, as well. Essentially, we're seeing destabilization of the core categories of power, consumer producers turns into users, authority, quality, accreditation. All of these were seen to have the proxy of capital as being a proxy for accreditation and authority and reliability, just as we saw yesterday with regard to Britannica versus Wikipedia. I think Judith Miller and the New York Times did a lot to help in destabilizing that belief. And on the other hand, uh, Wikileaks is doing a lot for the other direction. So you ask yourself today, actually, if Daniel Ellsberg has the Pentagon Papers, does he go to the New York Times or does he go to Wikileaks? And chances are he'll go to Wikileaks. It becomes an alternative platform that is more robust, potentially, than uh, the traditional uh, one. So then, let me put on the table one more thing, and that's, uh, uh, and that's a skeptical thing. So I spent a lot of time making this case, making this case uh, over the last few years. But then recently, I finished a study with uh, 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 um, uh, a colleague, uh, Aaron Shaw, um, looking at actually the actual practices. So the model of mass scale participation, daily costs, for example, to what extent is it uh, based necessarily on technology, and to what extent is their choice? So we looked at the uh, top 50 or 60, we, overall we looked at 155, top 50 or 60 left and right wing uh, blogs uh, in the US blogosphere is what counts as left and right in the US. Uh, and what we found was actually quite substantial uh, difference. So if you look at daily costs, you've got, uh, it uses Drupal, which is a platform that allows for quite extensive user blogs. Um, it has a strong use of user diaries, open threads. It has cultural and organizational model of highly committed users called rescue rangers going and looking out at all of the 10,000 or more given active user diaries to find specific things to draw to the front page. So there's fluidity from what users do in their pages to the front page that has about as many people uh, seeing it, if not quite as the New York Times, certainly as the Boston Globe, uh, on any given page. Um, and so you see a combination of technical platform adoption, organization in terms of 20 people on the mass head, 100 people in the inner circle, rescue rangers bringing in roughly uh, contributions for about 10,000 active contributors for, uh, uh, and about 400,000 registered users. Um, so you see at one level leadership, and one of the claim is this is just a replication of elite. Um, but on the other hand, you see a very different model. So Instapundit, uh, Glenn Reynolds, um, not only uses, uh, doesn't use uh, uh, Drupal, uh, uh, looks like there's something weird with the text. Ignore the text on the side. Uh, pay no attention to the man. Um, <laughs> comments are turned off. A sole author essentially making short links to various other news stories as a major player on the left and right wing. So looking at these, we looked uh, uh, on a larger scale, um, and what we found uh, was that if you look at enhanced platforms like Drupal or Soapblocks, uh, the 
left adopts them much more widely than the right. If you look at organizational model, whether or not you see a blog that is sole author as opposed to multi-author, the right has many more sole authored uh, uh, blogs than the left. If you look at large scale collaboration, by which we defined um, um, as over 20 uh, people uh, collaborating, the left much more uh, than the right. Uh, if you look at whether or not user blogs, because comments are too thin in order to allow people to actually have a presence over time that's actually stable and them on the site. User blogs other than the main authors. So this reflects how many major main authors there are. This reflects the degree to which non-main authors have a presence on the site that's their own diary uh, or blog. Again, uh, the left significantly more than the right. We looked at flexible content boundaries, by which I mean like rescue ranges. Is there a mechanism that's relatively easily available for content produced by users to come to the main page? Or is there sort of background user conversation, but no way to come to the front page of the site? Again, the left more than the right. Is there in-depth analysis or just linking? Again, yes, more on the left, less on the right. A lot less confidence in these findings that essentially the left also uses it more, much more for mobilization, calls to action, um, um, and fundraising uh, than the right. So why is this? There are all sorts of reasons why this might be. There are uh, stories about what psychologically makes for uh, somebody being a Republican versus uh, uh, a Democrat, which is really all left-right means here. Um, uh, that have to do with uh, authority and hierarchy seeking versus participation. Uh, I suspect, to me, the most likely story is one in which uh, when the blogosphere emerged around 2002, 2003, the right largely had its act together in control of government with, uh, with uh, mass media outlets like, uh, not like, Fox News and AM radio, with uh, uh, grassroots mobilization uh, 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 in churches. The left had a lot less. When the blogosphere emerged, it played a much larger role for the left in building its own uh, uh, platforms than the right. But we'll see uh, as we move forward and look at the Tea Party and how it uses whether these differences turn out to be stable uh, uh, and whether they uh, persist. For our perspective specifically, the reason that I put this here, other than that it's cool of you, um, is here's a context in which blogging software was available at the same time to both of these sites. And yet, it was adopted completely differently. One in a model that replicates the hierarchical model of a very relatively passive reader getting told what the news of the day and how to think about it. And the other in a model that actually allows <coughs> thousands of people a much more participatory role. There's no technological determinism in this. There are patterns of adoption over time. Which one will end up developing will, will tell us whether we we'll end up with a more ideal, open, participatory network <laughs> sphere, or one that simply replicates uh, what we already have. All of this leaves us with the hopes in 2006 that suddenly the net roots were able to exert power over the, the, the party in this, this particular effort to, to force safe seats to uh, give their money to the DNC so that they could support competitive uh, 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 races. The very high, everybody talked about how much money was raised online by Obama, but in fact, ActBlue uh, uh, raised uh, 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 very large amounts in small donations to competitive uh, districts also in 2008. But at the same time, we have the reality of uh, the White House um, uh, basically turning around and saying to uh, the same left uh, uh, blogosphere, uh, shut up. And power doesn't reside at the end of the day. And the critical question is how much of power actually resides in the ability to speak and how much of power ends up residing in the ability to control the, the power of the state. Uh, and so we remain with this question of relative effectiveness and the degree to which really the openness shifts power or not. And I think for that, uh, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have a real question. We've all known, as I talked about the Iranian uh, reform movement, about the enormous excitement around the possibility of, of video. We've seen the Iranian blogosphere as one that the state failed to block extensively. So this happens to be an image uh, uh, done by two colleagues of mine at the Berkman Center uh, um, um, 
uh, on uh, uh, on what's visible, the blog, the visible blogosphere in Iran. With this being the reformist, this is what's visible and this is what's blocked. So there are efforts of blocking, but they're far from perfect. Uh, so the question we remain with is we can identify discrete practices that destabilize the old models of control and power. And we can imagine and give case studies of success, effective success in changing, changing the agenda, changing the outcomes. But at the same time, we are also faced with the persistent power of the state and its responsiveness to aggregations of money. And the question that remains for us to study is the degree, to, and to observe and to try to build, is the degree to which actual effective power can be shifted uh, in these new uh, systems. So the floor is open, fire away. In one of your cases, you said that they had shifted to a different model. Can you, could you elaborate on that? And what kind of studies did you present? Uh, uh, the second case study, you said now they don't use the model that. Magnitude. Um, uh, so we're trying to figure out with him what he did in terms of his change. So, so magnitude is one of the is one of the um, um, music sites we looked at, um, and. Um, he moved, he decided that, that he, did, he experimented some with uh, monthly subscriptions. And what he found out was that people um, uh, wanted to just pay a flat fee as opposed to, uh, uh, as opposed to, um, pay per song. And so he continues, once you pay the fee, you continue to have a Creative Commons license fully digitally copyable content. So getting a subscription continues to be voluntaristic, but in that transition, which only happened in the last few months, he didn't bother to port the entire normative and, and the ability to have to pick different uh, um, uh, sites. So uh, we need to go back and interview him and see what he thought, why he thought about that, given that we actually have substantial data that his old system was working. Um, uh, from the perspective of whether it's useful data or not, the fact that we saw such stable levels of contribution over five years is to me more powerful than the decision of a person at a certain point to shift his business model uh, uh, and for now, for a few months, he's happy with it. Yeah? What do you see about the theory when they say with DRM that you don't own the song, but you own the license? You know, when you download music online, there's like a debate that you don't actually own the song, you own the license of the song. Uh, when you say, what do I think about that? Uh, what do you mean? Like, how do you see that, I probably should be more clear, like, how do you see that affecting the future? Like, with downloading movies online, where it says you don't own the movie, you own the light, rights to watch the movie. So, um, I think the effort there, I mean, technically, from a legal perspective, it's true, what you're getting is a license, not a physical copy. Um, essentially, what the industry is trying to do, digitization, before digitization, there was the technical fact that the way in which you needed to communicate information and cultural goods required that you communicate them in some atom container. Mm -hmm. So you had copyright law optimized around this idea of the container. And the trade-off between incentives and rent extraction for purposes of investment in cultural production and freedom to use the materials stabilized around what you could do with the copy. So you can get a copy and then you can sell it to someone else. That's the first sale doctrine. You can get a copy and you can cut and paste it and put it up on a, that, that's a certain kind of fair use and, 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 and ma mash it. With digitization, two things became possible. Option one is what we saw since Napster, which is massive copying, distribution, etc., and essentially destabilization of the ability to control the copy and the possible abstraction of the recording industry and direct relations between artists and fans. Not good for the recording industry. Um, option two, fantastic for the recording industry, the ability to control not a unit, but every use, and charge for every use, not for every unit. So the move to call it a license 
not a thing, mm -hmm. is the beginning of the effort or is part of the effort to make sure that you set up a legal environment that allows you to then say, I'll charge you this amount for being able to watch it for 36 hours, mm -hmm. that amount for being able to watch it three times, the third amount for 10 times, I'll be able to charge you more than that. You can't hand it over to your friends so the first sale doctrine goes out the window. It's, it's part of an effort to essentially create a legal framework that pushes you more in the direction of perfect ability to price discriminate between different use, users and uses, uh, rather than having some hard boundary that allows you to transfer the thing and then do whatever you want with at least that particular instance. You think it doesn't mean you fall back to that eventually? Because I mean, like apps, the same thing. Kind of like an iPhone. You don't technically own the app, you own the license. So well, when like, you I say fall back to that, you mean is like that going music. to be the stable end? Like music, what happened with music where a lot of music is no longer DRM? That's what I mean. Um, so it depends on which system we're going to be in. If we're in a system that runs over proprietary wireless networks, over devices that are heavily proprietary and use proprietary standards over mobile systems that are not particularly competitive, uh, I can easily see things stabilizing in the direction of a relatively controlled uh, uh, system. Uh, if we move towards something that has net neutrality applied to wireless, that has the potential for competition, potentially over Wi-Fi nomadic networks instead of just over uh, um, uh, instead of just over proprietary spectrum, uh, I, it's going to be much harder to maintain that. So, so essentially, you're, here's a way of abstracting and coming back to the point about multiple systems. I think the stable state, at least for a serious period, depends on a relatively stable uh, settlement between the multiple systems so that they can work. What happened with open systems is that they destabilized the relative comfort with which law and technology allowed cultural goods to be controlled. <clears throat> What's happening now is a possibility for a way in which that model still exists and it's now embedded in networks that are capable of uh, uh, effectuating it technically. Or we'll move to systems with, that continue to be open and the artists and the fans move or the software developers move to a system where they have a much more open uh, system. Each of those is relatively stable. It's not stable to have a really open system that anybody can do whatever they want with a really controlled cultural production model. Um, and I would be surprised if a really proprietary closed system ended up not trying to pull an open production system and leverage it to create rents from it. Okay. Thank you very much. S something that you didn't speak to at all I think is the um, level of, call it skill, call it cultural capital, that is needed to be a player in this new world. And is it not also hierarchical? Is this Bev Harris, someone who's a, uh, a uh, construction worker, or is it someone with a high level of education, so on? So there are two kinds of answers to that. Uh, the first is that skills continue to be a really important divide between who can and can't participate. Um, I think much more important, when, when people wrote about digital divide 10 years ago, they were talking much more about the cost of a broadband connection. Um, some of the most interesting work on this is work that Esther Hargitay <coughs> of Northwestern has been doing to actually measure uh, skill gaps across uh, uh, SES um, um, uh, categories, finding really and persistent skill gaps. The answer used to be, oh, it's just a cohort effect, wait, all the young people are all really savvy. I think Esther's work has shown that that's not necessarily true and you continue to see disparities across SES uh, categories uh, uh, irrespective of age. Um, so that's really important, but it suggests a very targeted intervention uh, in education which is to say focus on skills as a core enabling category for democracy, for cultural participation, etc. That's one kind of answer. Another kind of answer is accepting that how much is open to who 
relative uh, uh, relative to the relative to water entity, and the relative here is the mass mediated uh, environment where the entry barrier to participation was much higher. So if you look at one of the uh, at one of the the masthead contributors that I sometimes, in order to answer this question. Um, Uh, use um, there are various contributors instead of me reading it there are various contributors on uh, uh, on 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 daily cost that you actually read their profile and you see this is not your typical op-ed contributor in any shape or form that would make it onto uh, a site that has roughly the circulation of a mid to high level newspaper in the US. Um, and so it's somewhere in between. You do need a skills level, but, at the other, but on the other hand, you're talking about maybe a move from two, three, four thousand 4,000 people able to reach audiences of hundreds of thousands to the low millions. I don't know, one, two, three million people more or less. What is that, a percent of the population? Pathetic to call that participation. On the other hand, the difference between two or three million and a few thousand is a very big one. But the, <clears throat> mostly for this participation, you don't need particularly sophisticated computer skills. I mean, the interfaces are so easy now. It takes there's very little barrier to entry. It takes literary, literate, you know, literacy skills. You have to be articulate. But it's not that, that is the actual digitalized skills are not so great for lots of these forms of participation. So as it turns out, and this is, this is I'm mostly relying here on Esther Hargitay's work, it turns out that even what you think of as not particularly sophisticated, knowing what can be done, turns out that, that there's a real divide. In well, there's a knowledge, no, I, I would distinguish between an information or a knowledge gap. Some people don't know how, but skills, how long does it, would it take? For somebody who decides, I've heard about this blogosphere stuff, I've never seen a computer, I'd like to start doing it, how much training does it take to be able to become a participant? It's not high skill in that sense right. of long to acquire right. a skill. So that's, so that's why it's not a big skill gap. It's a, a, a skill gap that's a real gap that is pro if this required programming like it did you know, 20 years ago. Undoubtedly. So I, I, don't, I think it's a misdescription to call it a skill gap in the sense that that conveys an idea that there's a real barrier that would require a lot of training. That's and but, but But what I am emphasizing is that it turns out that even though the skills are not particularly sophisticated and complex, yeah. although again, it depends on what, how much of, when you're talking about writing an entry on daily costs versus producing a watchable yeah. mashup, those are two very different yeah, levels. Sure. I'm not saying just putting something together. Putting something that's watchable right. uh, is non-trivial. Right. Um, uh, so, so, yeah. so, so there's a range, and depending on what you're emphasizing as the important aspect, uh, the critical finding is that there is a persistent, even across ages, gap in terms of important class distinctions. Building on this and, and going back to the conversation that you and I had right before the beginning of the talk, um, having to do with the crisis in mass media or conventional media, isn't it the case that much of what you see on the internet is opinion and it isn't so much actual generation of investigative reporting that requires a great deal more capital uh, and professional training and long-term investment of, of, well, of time really. And to what degree is the, you know, the viability of the internet as a vehicle for actually compensating for the crisis of the conventional media? Actually, it, it's, it's suffering because much of what it does do is just circulate things that it gets out of the conventional media. The so. spirit of Bob McChesney floating over Madison. Yes, um, yes. Um, <laughs> so. I don't have a quantitative answer. Um, not, nobody does. But just today's stories suggest at least a qualitative answer, which is to say, who found the mistakes in the Diebold system? It was not someone 
who was in the traditional model of mass media. It was the fact that it was distributed, the fact that it was hard, meant that a professional uh, security, that, that, that an academic security center was able to identify it. Create a distributed peer review system that said, yes, these are valid problems directed to the state. The same for the emails, it wasn't even that. It was basically just people persistently reading the emails saying this is important. So that's a system. For WikiLeaks, do you disagree that the next Ellsberg goes to WikiLeaks and not to the New York Times? The answer is WikiLeaks. Now, where's the funding from WikiLeaks? WikiLeaks, last time I was able to look at it, though I, I, I need to try to update the numbers, about $600,000 per year for server space raised from donations. Right, but where did WikiLeaks take the information? From a whistleblower. No, I mean, where did they take it to? Who did they then distribute it to? They distributed it to a very small number, but you asked a different question. You asked yeah. about the investigation, not yeah. about the salience. Yeah. What they did was they used the cultural habits left over from the 20th century that what's important is what the New York Times says, which come from a period where capital stands for authority and credibility, and manipulated those to force them to project what came out of an investigative process that was decentralized. When I talked yesterday about the Sunlight Foundation and the investigative journalism about which member of Congress um, uh, uh, paid from their campaign funds, what did you have? You had a nonprofit building a platform that mashed together several, uh, pub several public data sites based on government required data, but each of them produced by a different nonprofit, harnessing de decentralized citizens to, mash, to mesh the data from multiple of these to get the investigative journalism. Who did that? A nonprofit foundation leveraging decentralized innovation. Uh, when I talked about, uh, um, uh, uh, about pork busters yesterday, same exact uh, model. Uh, when I mentioned ProPublica today, the, the Pulitzer Prize on the reporting, again, that's a non-profit model, but a highly professional non-profit model that is able to lower its costs by uh, doing things online. So my answer is, there are new economic conditions under which some combination of professional and non-professional commercial and non-commercial, are developing to use the new uh, 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 affordances to provide the same functions. And the concern over the loss of the traditional media is a concern that comes from looking backwards for the solutions, as they used to be under conditions where there was no option but to have someone who could afford the millions of dollars that it took to produce a paper. And then they became the anchor of authority. But that's no longer the model. It's not the model in software. It's not the model in encyclopedia. It's not the model in music. It's not the model on, on, in video entertainment. And it's not going to be the model in news either.